Welcome to the Doggy Dojo. I'm your host, Susan Light, a Los Angeles-based dog trainer on a quest to become worthy of the title, Sensei of the Doggy Dojo. Today, we're covering something that might seem simple, but is actually incredibly fraught. How do you choose a dog trainer? Many people don't know where to start and certainly don't know what to look for. The industry is unregulated, which means literally anyone can legally train dogs professionally. So how do you wade through the quagmire and find a good one? I'm excited to say I think I have the perfect guest to lead us through this topic. She wrote an article called How to Choose a Dog Trainer that I've actually got linked in my link tree right now. It's just an incredibly thorough and well laid out article that tells you everything you need to know to hire a dog trainer. And I'm incredibly honored she agreed to come chat with us about it today. She is the award-winning author of WAG, The Science of Making Your Dog Happy, and the creator of Companion Animal Psychology Blog and the Positive Post Newsletter. Her next book, Purr, The Science of Making Your Cat Happy, will be published in May 2022. She has a PhD in psychology, is an honors graduate from the prestigious Academy of Dog Trainers, and has an advanced certificate of feline behavior with distinction from International Cat Care. Please welcome Zazie Todd, PhD. Welcome to the podcast, Zazie. Thank you for inviting me on. I'm really excited to chat with you. I'm super excited because it's so hard to know where to start if you're not a pet professional, uh, knowing where to hire a dog trainer. And I have never come across such a clear cut, well researched, well reasoned, well you know laid out. Um, everything you need in one place resource as your article. Thank you very much. I wrote that because uh, people would tell me horror stories of what would happen when they went to look for a dog trainer. And unfortunately, dog training is not licensed and there are no requirements to call yourself a dog trainer. So there are some totally amazing, fantastic, wonderful dog trainers out there. But for the ordinary members of the public, sometimes it's hard to connect with those trainers. And there are trainers who are using methods that we know to be outdated and that have risks for your dog. So it's really important to choose a dog trainer carefully. Absolutely. So I will definitely be linking this in the show notes, one of the many things I'll be linking um, resources that you've provided for my listeners. But let's go through these. And I love, 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 just like you said, uh, the very top of your article, the most important choice. What is the most important choice in hiring a dog trainer? So the most important choice is actually to pick someone who's going to use reward-based methods, which basically means positive reinforcement. That means they're giving your dog something uh, that they like after they've done the behavior that you want, um, and that the behavior will then increase in frequency. So positive reinforcement is a technical term, and reinforcement means the behavior is going up. Positive means something is added, and the kinds of things that we would add typically would be food. So really, it means that you're looking for a dog trainer who's going to use food to train your dog. Now, there might be times when a dog trainer actually recommends play and toys, or some cases in which petting might be helpful. I think a lot of ordinary pet guardians think that praise is helpful, but we know from the research that's been done that praise doesn't really mean very much to a dog unless it's always followed by a treat. Like if you say good dog and give them a treat, they learn that it means there's a treat coming, but otherwise Absolutely. praise praise doesn't really mean much to them. Do you know what's really sad that I'd love for people to notice is that when a trainer or a dog guardian uses punishment when they praise their dog the reason sometimes it looks like the dog is happy is because all that is is predicting that a punisher is not coming immediately and it's very sad when so when, sad uh, when, when you think that that is a good thing yeah, and maybe it's worth touching on some of the reasons why it's so important to use positive reinforcement. And it's because we know that aversive methods have risks to them. And so that includes methods like shock collars, prong collars, choke collars, um, tugging on the dog's leash, um, what people call leash corrections, despite that that name it counts as an aversive method of absolutely course, yelling at the dog or hitting the dog um all of these things have risks for the dog's welfare and they include the risks of fear anxiety aggression 
stress and a worse relationship with the owner. And there's also research that shows that the dogs that are trained with aversive methods are more pessimistic, which is a way of assessing their longer term welfare. So positive reinforcement is much, much better for the dog's welfare. It doesn't have those risks. And on top of that, it's a really fun activity for the dog because we know that dogs like to work to win a reward like food. Absolutely. And if you want to know more about positive reinforcement, I actually have an episode about this where I talk with Dr. Karen London about all the studies and and the reasons why uh, we always recommend positive reinforcement. So um, hopefully we've convinced everyone that you want to look for a positive reinforcement trainer. Sometimes because it's an unregulated industry, the terminology is very difficult to sort through. So you want to look for positive reinforcement, fear-free, force-free, um, sometimes we say humane training methods, that's what you want to look for. Yeah, or sometimes also people will say reward-based, mm-hmm. and there are kind of certain words which are a, a red flag. So if the dog trainer's website is talking about dominance, for example, that's a red flag because we know that's an outdated approach to dog training. Um, It counts as an aversive approach to dog training. Um, And sometimes people will describe themselves as balanced. And, you know, if you just think of of that word in a different context, balance is usually a good thing. But unfortunately, in dog training, people use it to mean that they use both rewards and punishments. So, again, you need to be avoiding those aversive methods. So if someone says they're a balanced dog trainer, again, that means they're not using positive reinforcement and they're not the best trainer for you. Yeah. Boy, that was a good marketing day when they decided to use that word, wasn't it? It has screwed up so many people and dogs. I mean, because it's just so confusing for people. And also, I think the language changes over time. And so you just have to stay up to date on the kinds of things that people are saying and read read between the lines and be very careful because there's no regulations as to what people can or should say. Absolutely. Absolutely. So one of the ways to sort of suss that out is to just ask what what will happen to my dog if they do something right? What will happen if they do something wrong while you're training them? And that should give you an idea what what methods they're using. Yes, absolutely. And that's what the Jean Donaldson at the Academy for Dog Trainers calls the transparency challenge. People should be transparent about the methods they're using. So you should be asking dog trainers what those those exact questions about what will happen. And those answers will help you to know if they are the dog trainer for you or not. Absolutely. So let's get into, because I think hopefully we've convinced people, like I said, that you want to use a rewards-based positive reinforcement trainer. Um Obviously, some people still need convincing, but we're going to move on and assume that you've decided to hire a positive reinforcement trainer. Let's go into the quagmire of qualifications, certifications. Uh, How do you sort through that? People have letters behind their names. What does it all mean? Yes, so it's a good idea to look up those letters and It's helpful if people have letters that show they've got some kind of education Mm -hmm. because it really helps if they know what they're doing. And there might be other types of letters that show that they're members of a professional organization or passed a certification from that kind of organization. So there are different kinds of letters that you might be wanting to look for. Um, I gave some examples of some of the the best qualifications that people might have um, in the in the article, um, but there are other schools as well. And I, because the, you know the articles for international people, they, I don't know where people will be when they're reading it. I've just put the main ones that most people are likely to have heard of, and there are others that if you see, then you should look up look them up and see what they mean basically. But like CTC means a graduate of the Academy for Dog Trainers. There's KPA CTP, so they will be graduates of the Karen Pryor Academy. There's VSA CDT, which would be a graduate of the Victoria Stillwell Academy, or VSPDT, which means that they've been certified through the Victoria Stillwell uh, dog trainers. That's interesting. Two, also- it's two different certifications. Yeah, so the, the second one involves also having some experience and maybe having done the education somewhere else. Okay. And then being interviewed about that so you still have to prove that you've have, have you're capable yeah. as, a, as a dog trainer basically absolutely and then pmct which means that they've studied with pat miller um as well so the people who've taken these courses will be going to use the right kind of methods um and also they've got an education that tells them 
how to deal with behavior issues, how to train a dog to do different kinds of things, how to counsel clients, for example. Absolutely. And this is one of the things I really encourage people to check out on your article because you've really explained it beautifully about what these organizations are and what to look for and, and you know, why you want people who are from these organizations. Um, and it's really confusing. It's really confusing. I am in a Facebook group of dog trainers in my area and they're always being like, have you guys heard of this certification? What's this? You know, what's, what's going on? Do you guys know what this means? It's just so much out there because you can literally make up your own certification and certify people with it. It yeah, unregulated. And, and it is it is very confusing and, and that's why I stuck to listing the main ones and explaining what they mean because I think when you know what they mean it's it's actually really quite helpful. And so it's a long article that I wrote and that's why it's so long because I tried to go into detail on, on all of these different things that people might want to know about. Yeah. But I think it's a great it's a great resource for people because it's very, very confusing otherwise. So that is awesome. So let's talk about um so I, are you in the States now? Yes. I'm in Canada. Oh, Canada. I'm okay. in, in Maple Ridge, which is in BC near Vancouver. So um, I don't know how international all of these membership uh, groups are, but the next step that you could look for is membership of a professional dog training orga organization. Um, and you list a couple of great ones there as well. Yeah, that's right. So I list the Pet Professional Guild because people who are members of that organization will only use reward-based methods. And then I also list the APDT, the Association of Professional Dog Trainers. Um, and in the article, I've got the American version. And actually, I should go and update it and add the Canadian group because there's a separate Canadian group of, of dog trainers as well. And then the IAABC, so the International Association of Animal Behavior Consultants as well, which is that's an organization for animal behavior consultants, but many of them also will offer dog training classes. Yeah. So the Pet Professional Guild, and then there's also something called Certified Fear Free. Yeah. If they're fear free, they will have done an online course and committed to being uh, using reward-based fear free methods. And then they have to do a little bit of ongoing education to keep up the certification. Yeah. As well. Which I think is one of the best things about the certifications. If it requires continuing education uh, a lot because the continuing education and the science is tending towards force free, a lot of those continuing education credits should be informing trainers of the best ways and the best methodologies to train. Absolutely. And also things keep developing all the time. So what we know from canine science is developing all the time. So it's good just to make sure that you're staying up to date or that your dog trainer is staying up to date, you know, on the latest techniques for things. We're going to take a quick break. Don't forget to check out the article we're discussing to take full advantage of all the research Zazie has done for you. I've linked it in the show notes. I've also linked her blog and social handles and the links to order her books, Wag and Purr. You can even order signed copies if you happen to be listening from Canada. We'll be right back. But I want to talk about, so, so Pet Professional Guild is committed to Force Free and the Certified Fear Free is committed to that. But APDT and um, CPDT, which I'm a member of CPDT, I have a CPDT KA, um, they follow Lima. And I'd love to touch a little bit on Lima. Um, what that is and what it promises and what it doesn't promise. Okay, so I mean, LIMA stands for Least Invasive, Minimally Aversive. And I think there are many, many trainers who follow LIMA who basically are reward-based trainers. Um, unfortunately, there are some trainers who believe that they follow LIMA who are not reward-based only yes. trainers. And so I think that means that if you see someone who says they're LIMA, you still have to ask them a few questions about what what kinds of methods they're using. Yeah. So Lima, least invasive, minimally aversive. The It's a ladder um, and you can look it up. I, it's even linked in your article that we're discussing right now. You can look it up um, of the steps that you should take when you're approaching behavior modification. And, you know, the first step is a vet visit. Always. We want to make sure that the dog is feeling all right. And I think I saw something that said a new study saying what 80% of behavior problems may be presenting with pain of some kind. So, 
Yeah, certainly pain can be behind quite a few behavior issues. And an example of that would be a dog that suddenly develops a fear of fireworks when they were okay before. So if it's an older dog who's afraid of fireworks or other loud noises, um, there's been some research that suggests that those dogs certainly should go to a vet. I hasten to add I'm not a vet, but of you course. Know, that, that's the kind of situation in which you would want to refer someone to a vet and check that they're not in pain and the theory seems to be that the the loud noise causes them to startle and so if they have pain in their joints for Mm. example that actually causes them pain wow yeah so that's the first step for lima the second step is arranging the environment management uh and so those things are not invasive at all And then you're going down the ladder, starting with positive reinforcement and then going to the other quadrants. And the problem with Lima is that at the bottom of that ladder, it does say positive punishment, which is all of these aversive things that we've been talking about. And that's why these organizations that are committed to Lima, they'll say, it's right here on Lima. I've tried everything else. I've I've gone down the list and now I'm doing this. And quite often that's not the case. I've never actually seen a case where you went down all the correct steps and had to throw a shock collar on a dog. They always throw the shock collar on first and for somehow think it's still Lima. Yes. So uh, uh, basically, I think there are no circumstances in which you would want to put a shock collar on a dog. The research on shock collars does not show it to be any more effective than reward-based training. And in fact, specifically for teaching recall which is one of the things that people sometimes argue about them for uh, the trainers who use positive reinforcement actually got better results than trainers who use shock collars in the scientific study that looked at yeah. that um, and I think the thing is that training is a skill mm-hmm. and there is a lot that goes into it and so it could be relatively easy depending on someone's skill level to end up in a position where the trainer is making mistakes when they're trying to use positive reinforcement and so they think oh it's not working Um, and that should be a point at which you would refer to someone else or ask another trainer for advice rather than a point at which uh, someone gets out a shot collar no one should be using shot collars I I agree with that 100 percent Yeah. So I just wanted to touch on that for Lima, um, for anybody that might try to twist. It's like the balanced thing. It's all the try. It's the spin, right? And they'll be like, it's right here on Lima. And so lately I've been wishing maybe that they would rewrite Lima, but um, truly I don't think it was ever intended to justify training dogs with positive punishment the way it's been used. I think certainly at the moment, as it's in use by those organizations, it's not intended to justify that at all. And I think it's worth mentioning that IAABC has somewhat changed how they deal with it now in that if someone is at the point where they think they need to use a shock collar, IAABC requires them to get in touch and to discuss it. They have a little panel who will help them talk them through the case and talk about it so hopefully that will get some people to stop using them Um, but yeah it is really important that people use reward-based methods and just because someone says they're lima unfortunately it doesn't guarantee it even though many lima trainers are basically reward-based trainers. yeah i am so glad you mentioned that i was going to bring that up and it's actually one of the huge reasons why i did get my uh, CPDT KA, but I'm going to do my behavior consultant through IAABC. But I think it's it's great that you're you're getting those, and that's fantastic. And yeah, it's important to remember when we talk about some some Lima trainers, unfortunately, using those those aversive methods. It's not all of them. Um, there are many well intentioned, very well qualified people using using it as as a reward based approach. Yeah, and that's the way that it's intended. I def I think it's the way it's intended. Awesome. So the next thing you mentioned is something we touched on a tiny, tiny bit about continuing education for dog trainers and how important it is. Yeah. So again, because dog training isn't regulated, there's no requirement for people to stay up to date with things. They might have been a dog trader for 20 years, never have gone to any continuing education but a good dog trainer is going to and a good dog trainer will likely actually be a member of an organization that requires them to get some CEUs every year and they will list the things that they've done on their website typically so you'll be able to look and you'll see the courses that they've been to um, and I'm sure they'll tell you 
about them if you wanted to ask them, but you'll be able to see that they're staying up to date with things. Um, so that's always a good thing when people are staying up to date. Yeah, I think that's a great question to ask in your interview. Um, and you could slip it in all casual, like, oh, what was the last, like, continue, or like, I don't know how you would say it, any interesting webinars or books or articles? I mean, you, there's ways to find out if your trainer is committed to continuing education. You could, or if you've actually looked on their website and seen something, you could say, oh, I see you went to this course on such and such. Was it interesting? It sounds really interesting and ask them to tell you something about it. And then, you know, I'm sure they would be very happy to. They'll probably be thrilled and think they have this wonderful client. <laughs> it's really important to do a lot of research before you hire a dog trainer, um, not just go with the first person who comes up on a Google search or is mentioned in a Facebook group. Absolutely. But you do mention customer testimonials and social media in your article. Yeah, because anyone who's a good dog trainer is going to have lots of reviews. And the other thing is that if you're in an area where there aren't lots of trainers to choose from with those certifications or with those professional memberships, and you really are having to look very carefully, sometimes trainers disguise on their website the fact that they use shock collars because they know that's not going to be, bring people in and sometimes when you read the testimonials you actually can see it in there certainly I've seen that for several dog trainers where it's in the testimonials that people have written about the dog getting used to the collar for example so that's that's another way of, of checking out what they're like and if you see lots of glowing testimonials about how they've helped people whose dogs have similar issues to yours obviously that's a, a really nice thing to read and, and really encouraging that's such a good point yeah I've seen um on people's instagrams it's really usually easy to see if just scroll down all their pictures and you can tell what they're doing yeah like do the dogs look happy in their classes or do the dogs look happy in their training sessions because basically they should do they should look like they're having a fun time even if they're there for a behavior issue <laughs> yeah and I'll, I'll refer people back to lily chin and doggy body language because i feel like sometimes people misunderstand what they're seeing when they're seeing of dogs but um, once you learn it you cannot unsee it and you'll see if the dogs are really uncomfortable and nervous and shut down Absolutely. And I, I love Lily's book, Dog, Doggy Language. I think it's fantastic. And it does such a good way of illustrating all these different types of body language and what, what you should be looking for. Absolutely. And what if you can't find a good trainer near you? The good news is that these days there are lots of online options, which is really nice. I think it started mainly because of the pandemic. Lots of people had to find ways to keep working when there were lockdowns where they were. But a lot of people have kept it up since then because it turns out that it actually can work really well. And when you think about it, a lot of training a dog is actually teaching the person how to interact with the dog Absolutely. or teaching the person how to set up the environment for the dog and that kind of thing. And it's very, very easy to do that online. And so lots of people are still offering those options and it's it just it works really, really well. I think it's surprising how well it works, actually. Yeah. And I would say for some things, some types of behaviors, it's better, preferable than having somebody else coming into your home to stress your dog out. Yes, definitely. And another example, I think when it's especially helpful could be with separation anxiety. And a lot of the separation anxiety trainers only work online. They don't actually need to go into the home. They just need cameras on the dog to help them see what's going on and to help them make sure that the training is being done properly and to help coach people through that training. So it can work really, really well. Absolutely. So that's something that we skipped over. Let's go back to that. Separation anxiety is actually something that some dog trainers specialize in. Well, for separation anxiety, I think it's really helpful to have a specialist trainer. Often some regular dog trainers don't like to take that kind of case anyway. And that's They're very fine. tedious. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it can take a long time for a dog to get over separation anxiety. But when you know what to do, it works and you could get amazing results but for the people doing it they often have to suspend absences so they have to mm -hmm. have a whole village around them to help them uh, find someone to stay with the dog when they have no choice but to go out for example and then you have to work through this series of very small absences that the dog can cope with and then gradually build up the time so this takes a lot of time but you maybe only need to do short sessions every day so that's perfect for online training where you can just have five or ten minutes with your trainer 
and just do a little bit of training and then that's it until the next day. So that yeah. works really well. And there are some specialist um, certifications in that. And one example, absolutely fantastic from Milena De Martini, uh, CSAT. Um, that's a, a wonderful course that people can do. And there's another course from Julie Nace. Naismith um, called SA Pro. So some people will choose to specialize just in separation anxiety and they'll have done a course like this and they'll be there to help through a problem which, you know, it takes time to resolve, but it's important to know that you can resolve it. Yeah, absolutely. And what other things do people tend to specialize in? I know Michael Shikashio only does aggression cases now. Yeah, so some people specialize in fear and aggression, and some people don't want to touch fear and aggression cases. Um, and, and I think that's, you know, it's important for people to work on the kinds of cases that they enjoy and where they feel that their talents lie as well. So not everyone wants to do that kind of case. But the people with a lot of experience in it, they have, they can really help um, because they're used to seeing that particular kind of case. And for some of the more difficult issues, it helps to have someone who is more of a specialist on that on that topic so yeah that's Absolutely. that's another one and something else which is really good for online training is actually just some of the fun classes that you can do because you can even do tricks training classes online um, and I think that's really nice if you're looking for something to do with your dog but you don't have something local you can still find that online as well which is very nice yeah that's awesome I love doing and you can even test for your trick title by video now yes that's right yeah very cool. Was I so like, this is like a I was going to print it out. It's like a 24 page article. So I really encourage you guys. It is like I said, the absolute best, uh, well researched, well laid out, perfectly explaining all of the many aspects resource for finding a dog trainer. Uh, so obviously, we haven't hit absolutely everything. Uh, but I'll link it in the show notes. Zazie, was there anything else you wanted to make sure we touched on before we sign off? Um, I would just say, I, I mean, we mentioned it already. Hopefully we convinced everyone, but I would say use reward based training methods. Um, and if you want to read more about the science of why that's important, then you can read my book, Wag, the Science of Making Your Dog Happy. Um, but also, of course, people can find a lot of information on my website, Companion Animal Psychology. Absolutely. And there, there's a link within your this article that I'm talking about that I think is going to link to one of your other posts as well about why you should use seven reasons to use reward-based dog training. Yes, that's right. Yeah. I've got tons of useful things. And actually, I have a page just with links to all the articles that I've written about dog training. And then I've got another page to links about other kinds of articles about dogs like how to provide enrichment for dogs and that kind of thing. Um, and also I have a, a weekly newsletter that's free for people to sign up for. Um, and it's coming up to 10 years of me writing Companion Animal wow. Psychology. And believe it or not, this particular article is one of the top articles that I've got on my on my blog. Uh, it's so important and people really, really need a resource like this. I actually have a link to it in my um, Instagram bio. Oh, thank you. <laughs> because it is just the best place to start, honestly. And it's just so easy to say, you know what you should do? You should start by reading this article. <laughs> it's uh, You're such an amazing resource, Sazie. Thank you so much. And you don't just specialize in dogs. You have a book about cats coming out as well. That's right. I have a book called Per the Science of Making Your Cat Happy, which will be published in May. And it's available for pre-order now. And it takes a similar approach to WAG. So they're like sister books, basically. They look at how when you know what your dog or your cat needs and you provide it for them, then they're much less likely to have behavior issues and they're more likely to have a good relationship with you. So it's full of tips on how to care for your cat, how to set your house up for your cat, how to provide enrichment for your cat. And it starts with getting a cat and goes all the way through their life to helping a senior cat and making those difficult decisions at the end of a cat's life and then right at the end of the book there's a checklist for a happy cat just like at the end of wag there's a checklist for a happy dog so people can see what they're already doing right and see also if there are a few things that they might like to try adding to the enrich their dogs or cat's life Thank you, Zazie, for joining me today. My biggest takeaway from this conversation is you really have to do your research to know who you're hiring. If you're still looking for a place to start, make sure to check out the full article. It really will give you so much information. It's linked in the show notes, and I've also linked a few directories 
for some of the biggest professional organizations here in the U.S. for you as well. Thank you for stopping by the dojo to learn with me this week. This is your aspiring sensei, Susan Light, signing off. You can find me at doggydojopodcast.com or I'm Susan Light LA on Instagram, Pinterest, and Facebook. The music was written by Mac Light. You can find him at maclightsongwriter.com. And if you like the show, you can support it by subscribing, sharing it with your friends, rating it, and reviewing it on Apple Podcasts. I'll be back in two weeks with a brand new episode of the Doggy Dojo. Thank you.